what ley lines are, what the earth grid is. Because the earth grid is a powerful thing in relation to human history, in relation to Atlantis, um, in relation to our environment, how it affects us. Okay? What makes Asheville a really special place, okay, is the ley line that runs through it. There's tons of ley lines that come into Asheville. There's one particular one that's very interesting. This ley line goes through London, goes through Stonehenge, goes through Boston, goes through New York City, goes through Philadelphia, goes through DC, goes through Roanoke, Virginia, uh, north here just a little bit, goes through Asheville, and it goes through Orleans. New Orleans. is composed of these scalar waves. And so when I'm talking about these, these longitudinal waves moving along the surface of the Earth, they're everywhere. But there's certain points where they're extremely compressed. So when I'm talking about through ley line, the running through Asheville, that ley line, is a very, very dense ley line. There's a ton of energy density in that that's being moved through. Now, let's say this ley line has a wavelength of, of, of 10 feet, or the distance between these two monitors. This is one tower, this is another tower. I'm building these towers at specific points at those ley lines, at a node on the, way, on, on the ley line. Maybe say where two ley lines are crisscrossing. Where they crisscross, you will always have a node. That's where, you, where a vortex manifests, is when you have ley lines cross. And so, if you have one node of, of a longitudinal wave or another node of a longitudinal wave, and you get these two towers oscillating, electromagnetically, you have this energy you can start to tap into longitudinally. This is what Tesla understood. He said he had a, a sphere on top of this tower. The sphere can charge um, uh, electromagnetically. It can compress the ton of energy onto the surface of the sphere. And Tesla was working on design what geometry has the most surface area. How can I get all this energy into the boundary layer between the copper and the dielectric? And Say one of these spheres is charged negatively, one of these is charged positively, okay? You start to take advantage of all the dielectric in between them. You're creating this waveguide. And 
so there's already a wave there, though. It's not only tapping the electromagnetic wave, you're tapping in this longitudinal wave. But the big thing about it is the way you're tapping into it, not only can you pull energy from it, you can put energy back in. You just create a tree. You forgot it. Not any type of tree, a very, very powerful tree. And it's multi-purpose. Not only can we get energy from it, we can put energy back into the system. It's symbiotic. So that's the technology we have to get into, is constructive, cohesive technology. Everything we're using is destructive. It's using centrifugal force. It's taking away from the system. Um, there's a man named Tom Bearden, who actually assisted with the development of HARP, if you've heard of HARP. And um, he did not mean for what happened, uh, how they're using it now. But what Tom Bearden says is, don't kill the polarity. It's one of the most important things about energy you can understand. So you should take a battery, and connects to yourself, you're losing that polarity. You want to build up that polarity. Mm -hmm. And so, personally, in my life, as I say, uh, I, I try to find balance. I like to find balance by going to both extremes mm -hmm. at once. Okay? Mm -hmm. You're building yeah. the polarity. Yeah. 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 All over the place. Yeah. And, so, uh, and so, in these systems, we're storing the energy. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not dissipating it. You want to build up those polarities. So once those polarities are built up, you can take advantage of all this dielectric medium in between. And actually, the farther the towers they are, are away, the more energy you can get out of the system. And so, um, in terms of the ancient days with ancient, with, with ancient sites and where they're built on specific plants, or parts of the planet, they help support this ley line system. It's this breath of the Earth. And um, it supports the electromagnetic field of the Earth. And so right now with the deforestation, at the exact same time, the Earth's magnetic field is growing weaker. Every day it's growing weaker. It's the weakest it's been on known record since the, as far as back we can look back. It's the weakest it's ever been. And so the thing to understand with, when I say magnetic field, you really not think about it as the chi of the Earth. And it's also the free will of the Earth. The more, more energy we put into it, the more free will the Earth's willing to put forth. And so what I mean by that is, say there's some object in space that is also asserting its own free will, its own magnetic field. It comes close to us. It can influence how, we, how the Earth moves, influence our magnetic field, to a point where we even the idea of a pull shift. But if the Earth is able to assert its free will during such an event, we won't be affected. We will be asserting our being. We are asserting our existence upon this planet. Right now, we are not doing that as, as, as a collective. However, there is a polarization happening where there's just a very small group moving in an extreme other direction. And personally, I'm feeling those tides change. And I'm really starting to feel, um, as I said last night, free will is running rampant on this planet never before. And it's doing beautiful things. And I can't wait to see what happens with it. And so that's the, that's the main idea behind the Tesla Towers, tapping into these energies of how to create symbiosis. Because the beautiful thing is, say one of these towers puts out 10 units of energy. If I can build all these little other towers, like at your home, you can build an antenna, place it in the right spot, and tap into this energy. But the thing is, say oh, you're tapping in the main tower, it's like you're sort of tapping in the main tower, and the main tower might produce 12 units now because there's another tower coupled to it. But this other tower is going to be producing 5 units of energy. So the more towers you get into the grid system, the more exponential the energy output in the system. You're getting into resonant, you're getting into coherent vibrational technologies. And so I'm talking a lot about the technological aspects, but there's a lot of people in here that can take these ideas and start to apply them to other things. One thing I do is I do fire dancing, which I will be doing tonight, is with fire dancing, you can take these ideas and start to apply it to, apply it to the movement. It goes across all boards, figuring out how you can apply it. Um, and it's, it's, it's a holistic thing. So what I've laid out is some foundational patterns to science in the very beginning. I'm personally applying them to technology, but we can apply them to anything. And because what science is, it's the language of our external reality. But again, if you want to um, transform your internal reality, you've got to transform your external reality at the same time. It's one and the same. Because um, the external is just a reflection of the internal. And, and, and working with both of them is where you find this really beautiful boundary layer. And so, uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that and leave it open for questions. Yeah. I'm going to have to make some much energy and it mm -hmm. needs to be grounded if you too much of the mm -hmm. ground will happen to the sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
making all these points about feeding off the energies going between each other and having a stable amount, but will ever if you don't use enough of it, is it too much for the ground to take the mold? Maybe the earth? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a good question. I would most likely say no. Uh, yeah, it's, what it's, not, it's not. If, if we built up too much energy, um, say, would it be detrimental to, like, would you have to, like, ground it, you're saying? Well, I mean, if you don't use it, then it has to go somewhere. Energy has to go somewhere. Yeah, but that's, the towers can also work out on demand. As in, it, it's just like a car is like, uh, or like a generator. If you have an electrical generator running, it's going to run at a very low rating. You start to, start to you turn on a power tool, plug into it, it starts turning on more. Same with the towers. And so they're, they're, it's, it's on demand. Um, and, uh, yeah. Wouldn't it create like a balance and a flow? When we start building the towers? Yeah, I mean, it would. No, absolutely. It, would, it, it couldn't go too high, it didn't go too low because it would automatically balance itself out and flow. So it's you just, it's your, there's down. no stagnant energy, you're getting the energy to flow. So there's parts of the ley line where energy does build up. And you start to build, say, the towers or obelisks or, or other things to help facilitate that flow. There's lots of ways to facilitate flow. You can have a ceremony on a sacred spot and start facilitating that flow. So there's lots of ways to approach it, you don't need to approach it just with technology. Yes. Are there towers out there? There's a few. There's not many. Um, people have been doing some in Russia. I know someone doing one in the Midwest. I have a tower built in Asheville that's 27 feet tall. Hmm. That project's on hold at the moment because we're building a tower at another location that's larger. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were saying that magnet or um, the the in in the balance of male and female energy. Mm -hmm. um, male is magnetism because it's expansive and, and electrical is like trying to compress and that's female. Um, I've always seen it the other way in that the, uh, if you think about like uh, how male energy moves in, in straight lines and female energy moves in curves, Magnet, uh, magnetism is like a wave, it's, it's female lines, whereas the electrical, um, you know, think about lightning, right? It's like, it's like a big straight line fractaling into smaller straight lines, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess that would, would that be just the, um, the, the male aspect of the female and the female of the male and like this kind of infinite fractaling within itself? That was the same thing I asked him two weeks ago. <laughs> what was his answer? <laughs> I didn't get one. The thing is, energy never truly moves in a linear format. And so when I'm even saying like the longitudinal waves, it looks like they're moving in a line between them. They're still moving in helical forms. I forgot, we had this little uh, demonstration we could do in the end. Um, but they're still moving in a helical form. So it's always moving in, in helical curved forms. And that's one thing with all the way we're moving energy in our system, we're forcing it moving in specific ways. And we have a term called eddy currents in, in electrical transformers, and eddy currents are considered a loss of energy. It's a waste. It creates heat. But we're not using those eddy currents. We're, we're forcing the, 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 the energy to move in specific ways when it doesn't want to. We want to take advantage of those eddy currents. Okay. And so um, both magnetism and electricity or, or curving forces, as they say, one spiraling in, one spiraling out. Okay, then that brings up another question. Because mm -hmm. yesterday I was asking you about, or I was telling you, we were talking about the trion ray and the like, the light particle, and you were saying that space is linear, and therefore things like cubes can exist because they they have straight lines, um, and that's part of the paradox is that the trion ray can only exist as a curved line yep. and not a straight line. But just now you just said nothing moves linearly, so isn't it more safe to say that the trion ray can exist because straight lines don't exist except in the human consciousness, which we well, create. Well, I was saying they, they exist only in a purely static state. And so when we're talking about that, we're talking about abstraction that hasn't really been grounded yet. That's why we're discussing it, because I'm not fully sure either. Static as in it doesn't move or it Well, as I was saying, I said, I, 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 what I said is I'm not fully like, boom, yeah, the trion ray is part of the platonic solids. I'm not sure. What mm -hmm. I'm saying what was interesting is it only exists in a spherical format well, it's not solid, it's just Okay, I understand. I, so I don't fully understand it either. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it brings you back to your central point perspective. Mm -hmm. well, so, yeah, that one Good. example I didn't bring up that I told a few people here, and this relates to quantum physics um, being misunderstood with perspective itself, is if I did, I was holding a cube in my hand, and you see this cube. This cube has these harsh, straight, linear lines. Okay? It's how we traditionally view a cube. You view it from the outside in. What happens when you view it from the inside out? You put yourself in the exact center of the cube and you look at the cube around you. All of a sudden, those straight lines in a cube become curved. They get projected on a sphere. 
So there's different perspectives within the micro and the macro of viewing things inside out. That is what is a fundamental problem in quantum physics. Where we, there's experimental data, it's right, it's experimental data. It's the interpretations and the observations. And why I keep saying physicists is you need to go take an art class. You need to go understand perspective and how perspective works. So if you take that into um, account with your experiments, how you're perceiving the information, you actually start to interpret the information correctly. I had another idea right when you said that, which was that the trion rate in linear space is literally a straight line because it goes straight through. So that would be that. <laughs> so it can exist in both, it just appears differently. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's talk about it more. <laughs> it's a good one, it's a really good one. Uh, but has in quantum yeah. physics uh, placed um, physics uh, sort of at a uh, uh, medium level of truth? And is it not sort of what the model is that the observer affects the experiment and all its consciousness? So. I'm not saying all quantum then, physics is wrong, but uh, it's more of quantum, a lot of the quantum mechanics is wrong. And so there, there's that, you're talking about the double slit experiment and, and showing how we affect uh, a wave and a particle. But again, what if it's just existing as a wave and a particle at the same time? That's what I am. I'm a human and a spirit at the same time. Because if you're looking at something <laughs> spiraling around like this, you see it spiraling as a circle. But if you look at it like this, you see it moving like a wave. So I'm going good. to get my bowl and we're going to eat when I come back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the, the well, you're saying the two truths that are when speaking quantum and speaking Newtonian physics, you're speaking two languages that are so far really good. Yeah, yeah, like that mm -hmm. mesh or yeah. agree with each yeah. other. Yeah. How are you doing? Language fails there. Uh, yeah, I would talk uh, much more about We're going to do some really intense work after this. So, the majority of the time, it's just concrete. You can see it. Um, see it. A, a plus B equals C. Um, I mean, Composite is all based on statistics. And, um, and, and predicting or an observation. An observation with those statistics. Um, but the thing is, is reality, reality is concrete when it, when it comes to that information. We, the information is not randomly going everywhere. So this comes to the philosophical understandings of physics. Is it an open system? Is it a closed system? That's the biggest, really the biggest argument in physics. It's not even really an argument anymore because physicists say it's a closed system and it is an open system. And so it's, it's getting the fundamental philosophies of how to perceive the information. Because the big driving force has been the double slit experiment being Hey, is something consciously happening or something else happening? Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things that, that brings it to practicality, <laughs> like Dan Winters was talking about, the ability to steer a tornado, when people get blown away with that, and they say, you know, is that doable? It's not only doable, but what we're doing it all the time, either subconsciously or unconsciously. And it's a choice. It's a choice between fear of something that doesn't even really exist, but it's imagination that makes it so real that it will come and blow your house down. <laughs> People right now are starting to make the choice for love so greatly that our perspectives have changed. And we're controlling not only our environment, but we're controlling the only thing that we can is our thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's to Newtonian physics. We just haven't completely done that yet. I mean, science starts as heresy and winds up as superstition. Pretty soon, what we understand is Newtonian physics as well as its work since uh, um, Isaac's uh, lesson of the spiritual thinker. Uh, and attempting to, to solve that dilemma, he came up with uh, a bridge between what we've understood and to where we're going. But we're not really there yet. Quantum is just beginning to discuss things from a standpoint that makes Newtonian physics the science fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Newtonian any day of the week. Um, and one thing I wanted to add to the tornado is a personal experience. I first, I first hitchhiked into Asheville about a year ago. And right after the, the first week I was here, I went to Huntsville, Alabama. And that was the week when all the tornadoes hit uh, Alabama. And when I was in Huntsville, 
Uh, this, uh, it was a you know dark dark black storm coming in. And with my friend from Huntsville, he was like, "Don't worry, as long as you see a little bit of purple in the clouds, that we have a problem." Five minutes later, he's like, "All right, we're going home. There's purple in the clouds." And we start flying on the road. And everyone's just driving crazy. Um, the uh, the alarms are going off, and I'm in the car with a video camera, watching as a mass starts to form in one of the in one of these T cells, and it start it starts spinning and, and, and getting close down on the Huntsville. It's in downtown Huntsville. This tornado, and but what happened is all of a sudden it started to dissipate and then it just disappeared. And what I thought was interesting is you don't hear much about tornadoes hitting major cities, and there's a couple of reasons scientifically um, to do with the buildings. But um, what I felt personally that day, intuitively, is that so many people looked up and saw that storm, saw it forming, because it's forming slow enough over the sea that people hindered it from forming and grounding in downtown and so. And so uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that when you have something of a huge vertical mass, the there's so much energy mm -hmm. moving in that, that there is conscious energy that we can tap into and connect to. We did it consciously. Comma Ellen, it literally disintegrated when we decided we weren't going to be afraid of it. I think and something else happened. That's not right. just me. It's <laughs> so terrible. We're on made the right direction. To say Ellen wasn't nothing. And it just broke <laughs> up. Can we keep doing that at a greater and greater level? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I hope. So, but Ellen and That's something. true. Um, and so, one of the things about my work, I was just going to say in terms of affecting, is uh, I've done a lot of research with, with pole shift and understanding pole shift. And the thing about working on the grid is we can do things to, to, affect, to affect the outcome in very powerful ways. And such as pole shifts happen. It's a scientific documented fact it happens. The question is how much does it happen? Everyone has how does it affect in their lives. How does it happen to influence a pole shift? The thing is, well, it's got to happen. Uh, we have the free will to respond to that situation and completely prevent that situation. All right, you guys, we're going to interrupt. I want to um, invite you guys to talk to Gregor all weekend because he's available to you guys. Apparently, he's got all y'all interested in a lot of stuff. So, but we're running a little bit behind schedule, and I know you guys are hungry, and we have some really important stuff that we're going to do during lunch and after lunch. And so, um, we could just wrap it up, and uh, we'll get we'll start lunch here, and then I'm gonna bring in David Beeler and Nathan, and we'll talk about some other stuff. Then we need one more. Well, thank you, everyone. Here. It's been wonderful. Does anybody want to help serve? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so tomorrow I'm going to be doing a presentation at like 11. Do you want to come? Yeah. I might have to be leaving by like 12. I, I want maybe at least two angles. Yeah. 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 Yeah.